Hey, welcome to JavaScript Dynamic Web Programming for Beginners. My name is Lawrence. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. I come to you with many years of web development experience, and I'm ready to help you learn more about JavaScript. The upcoming lessons are going to be within a fast-paced format, demonstrating how to use the very basics and fundamentals of JavaScript coding in order to interact with web page content. All of the source code is included, and one of the best ways to learn is to try the code out for yourself. We're going to start by covering how to set up your developer environment and the tools that I'm going to be using in the upcoming lessons, then how to add JavaScript into your HTML pages, what the different data types and objects, how to set variables, what JavaScript functions are and how you can use them to run blocks of code, and then making your web pages interactive by connecting to the document object model and updating and manipulating properties of page elements. Also covering conditions and how you can use those in JavaScript for loops, while loops, and how you can loop through content. And then some of the commonly used methods that are built into JavaScript, such as random and as well as string methods. And we've got a final project to wrap up the lessons and to bring it all together in order to create a interactive JavaScript list maker that can be interactive with and create new web page content and new web elements. Please note that HTML and CSS experience is a prerequisite to this course, as well as the design of the course is to focus on using JavaScript and the core and fundamental syntax of JavaScript that's needed in order to make interactions with web page elements. This course is perfect for beginners to JavaScript that are interacting with the DOM, as well as those that are looking to refresh their skills of JavaScript and using JavaScript in order to interact with page elements. So creating dynamic and interactive web pages. Thanks again for joining the course. I'll see you in the next lesson. We're gonna start coding some JavaScript. This lesson's gonna be about setting up and getting ready to write some JavaScript code. So covering all of the essentials that you're gonna need, including an editor and a browser, and how to access your developer tools within the browser, creating an HTML file, and then creating some simple JavaScript statements in order to output some content within the document page, as well as to add an alert pop-up window when your page loads. And this is all done with JavaScript, and we're covering this and start coding in this lesson. I've got my editor opened on the left-hand side. The editor is going to be the place where we're going to be writing our code, setting up an HTML file. And this HTML file can then be used to host the JavaScript code within it. And the HTML file is the one that we're going to run within the browser. And I'll show you how to link to the JavaScript shortly. You are going to need to have an editor in order to write code. The suggested editor, as well as the one that I'm going to be using, is Visual Studio Code. So this is a free open source editor. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. So if you don't have an editor, or if you're looking to use the same editor that I'm using, you can head on over to code.visualstudio.com and download the editor and do an install of the editor. So you got the editor set up, then you are also going to need to have a browser. The browser that I'm going to be using is going to be the Chrome browser. And one of the benefits of the Chrome browser is that it comes with developer tools. So you can open up on any web page and click anywhere that's open on the page and right click on a Windows machine or control click on a Mac. And that will open up the pop-up window menu where you can select inspect and then that will open up the dev tools. And from there you can select from the elements and the second tab in is console. You can also customize how the developer tools are showing up. So going to the three dots, you have an option to set it to dock to the left, to dock to the right, which is the default, or you can dock it to the bottom. For most of the lessons of the upcoming lessons of this course, I am gonna have it docked to the bottom. You can also pop it out in a separate window. There are some settings that you can select. There's also more tools, more options to customize your experience with the dev developer tools. So I'm gonna be just using the standard setup, a console, and this is where we can interact with the JavaScript code from our web pages. 
There's another way to open up the dev tools as well. So if you close it and you go in the top right hand side where you've got the three dots and under the three dots, you've got an option called more tools. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that menu, it says developer tools, and that's going to open up the developer tools window. You can also use the shortcut in order to open up the developer tools. So that's going to all open up the same windows. And from here, you can write some JavaScript code, do an inspection of your existing code and communicate with the developer console messages coming from JavaScript. So once you have your editor installed, you can go ahead and open up a new file. And if you are using Visual Studio Code, you're going to get presented with a welcome screen. So this welcome screen gives you some options where you can learn more about the Visual Studio Code, where you can customize your environment. Uh, there's some help options down at the bottom. And in order to create a new file or a new folder, you can click under the start. There's option also to open a folder. And then if you've got some recent work, you can select those recent files to open those. You can also from the file menu at the top where you can create a new file and then add it into a folder and a workspace. So let's go ahead and we're going to create a brand new file and save this file as index.html within a brand new folder and saving the file as index.html and close the welcome tab. And I'm going to close the other two files that I had opened earlier. Let's go ahead and we'll set up this file as an HTML file, specifying the doc type and then creating the HTML tags, opening and closing tags, as well as the opening and closing head tags, and as well as the opening and closing title tags. And I'll call it JavaScript course. And then within the body of the tags, this is where we can add in a div and we can make some interaction later on with JavaScript for this div. So I'm going to just give it a class of output, and this can just be a blank div on the page. So once you've completed that, you can save that. And now you've got an HTML file that you're ready to add some JavaScript code into. If you want to run it in the browser, one of the easiest ways of Visual Studio Code is to just drag it over to the browser, and this will open up the file locally, running it at the local address that you have on your computer. And you can also open it directly from that address by selecting the file and opening it within the browser. Now let's add in some JavaScript to this file. And there's several places that you can add JavaScript where you can add in the script tags anywhere within the HTML code. So typically you will have the script tags in one specific spot, either at the top of the page within the head or either just before you close the body depending on what your JavaScript is doing. If you're interacting with the content of the web page, creating an interactive web page, then best is to place the JavaScript code at the bottom before you close off the body tags. So wherever you place the JavaScript code, this is where the code is going to get run. So if we do something like a document write, and I output a value of hello world using the document write and refresh the page, this will add in that particular output wherever the JavaScript code is added to the page. Above the output and within the output, let's just fill that in to say output. And now I refresh it. I'm going to have the first hello world above and the second hello world is going to be below the output area. I'll make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. The script tags will allow us to run the JavaScript code within it. So the JavaScript code is the code that's actually contained within the script tags. And when we're writing JavaScript, we can either use the script tags and have the code directly within the same page as the HTML page, or we can link it out to a separate JS file. And there are some benefits to linking it out to a separate JS file. And one of them is that you can reuse the code across multiple pages or even on the same page that every time you call to that script, it's going to run the script within that place. So let's go ahead and we're going to add in the script file. So we're going to create a new file on the same directory as index.html and we'll link out to that JavaScript code. And then we're going to render the JavaScript code the same way that we just did but it's going to be sitting within a separate file. So we're going to separate out the HTML and the JavaScript. So create a new file. I'm going to call it app1.js. Take that exact document write content, place it within the app1.js. And instead of having code within the script tags, I'm going to use an attribute where I'm going to link out to the source and select the JS file that I want to use as a source for this JavaScript code. 
this is going to do is this is using the script tags to link to a JS file and it's going to render out the JavaScript code just as it would if it was sitting within and between the script tags. So let's refresh our HTML page and we see we still get that hello world 2 output being rendered out from the JavaScript code. So for the JavaScript, it actually doesn't matter if it's sitting within the HTML with a separate JS file, it will still render it out. The point at which it gets rendered out is whenever the HTML file is loading, it's going to hit the script tag. And then at this point, it's going to go over to the app1.js and load the code, run the code, and then continue and complete the running of the application. So if we were to have a second element, and I'll just call this output two. This can be output one. We refresh the page. And within the app one JS, we're gonna do what's known as an alert. So this is a little pop-up message that you will see whenever the page loads. So let's run the code again. And this is our pop-up message that says that the page says hello. And notice that behind the scenes, the rest of the content of the page hasn't finished loading as we haven't finished and closed off the body content yet until we let the JavaScript complete running. So what's happened is that the code has come in, it's read the HTML code, so it's added in the title there at the top, and it's outputting the content, but before it can finish outputting the content, it's rendered and connected to the JavaScript code, which is running this code here, where it's not gonna complete running the code until we hit the okay on the alert. So the alert is stopping the rest of the page from loading until we hit okay, and then it's gonna finish rendering out the rest of the code on the page, including writing the JavaScript and including finishing off the HTML. So that's why typically when we do have JavaScript, if there are any issues with it, and we're linking out to a separate file, we try to keep it at the bottom so that at least all of our web page content will load. And if we're throwing an error, if it's having trouble connecting to the JS file, then it's not going to interfere with the output that's being displayed to the user from the page. So go ahead and try this out. Create an HTML file and then link to a JS file. You can use the document write to output some content on your page. In addition, you can output using the alert and have the little pop-up window from the alert text. And you can be ready to move on to the next lesson.
So this lesson, we're going to have some fun where we're going to be looking at different ways to loop through content. Loops allow us to run blocks of code a number of times by setting conditions and then incrementing the values until the condition is no longer true to stop the loop from running. I'll show you how you can take an array, output the values of an array, how you can take the object, output the values of the object into the console, and then also how you can select number of page elements using the query selector all, loop through each one of them, add an event listener to them that's going to track different clicks on each one of the element events. So when we refresh, it rebuilds the content from output 1, 2, and 3 to say new 1, 2, and 3 using the index value plus 1 of each one of the elements that we've selected on the page. So if we were to add in another element with a class of output and add it into the page, we would get the incremental increase of those values. And each one of them is now going to have its own event listener that you can click and track the number of clicks on that page element. And that's all going to be done with the loop where we're setting up the event listeners on the separate page elements. Create a new JS file, link it to the HTML file. And within the JS file, I'm going to show you how you can create some loops. The first loop that we're going to be looking at is going to be the for loop. And what loops do is they allow us to run the same code over and over again. So saving us the trouble of having to write out the code multiple times. Let's create a variable. And this can be that counter, setting it at a value of zero. And for the for loop, we need a starting value for the for loop. So we're going to use the variable of i, set it to a value of zero, and loop through while i is less than the value of 10. So while this condition is true, this loop is going to continuously run. Once the condition is false, then the loop is going to stop running. We're going to increment i by 1. And then the block of code that we're running within the loop is contained within the curly brackets. So for now, we're going to take the console and output the value of i within the console log. So let's refresh it. And that gives us a count starting at 0, which is the value of i, and iterating through looping, running this block of code where we're outputting into the console constantly until we have a value of 9. And then the next round would have been that the i is equal to 10. This condition is no longer true, and that's where we're going to be breaking the loop. Let's take the value of counter. We're going to increment it by 1, and we'll add the value of counter within the loop. So that outputs the result of counter. So when the block of code runs, initially the value of counter is set at 0. It increments by 1, so that's where we get a value of 1 for the output. And at this point, when we're outputting into the console, the value of i is still 0, but counter has been incremented by 1 because the statement is before the console message, and that's where we're getting the output of 1 for counter. If we have an array with multiple items in the array, we can use the array values as index values and output the corresponding values of that array using a for loop. So let's try that out, where we're setting the value of i to be equal to 0. So we know that arrays start with an index value of 0. We'll loop through while the value of i is less than the value of length. We know that the arrays have the length of the number of items that are contained within them. So that way we can check and we can make sure that we're looping through all the items in the array. And within the console, we're going to output the values of arrays using the index value of i. So take a quick look and we'll see how that results. I'm going to remove out the value of console. And now we're getting all of the values that are contained within the array. So these are array values. And that's outputting the corresponding values with their index from the array, outputting it into the console. There's also a few other ways that we can loop through arrays. So using an array method, such as for each, and that will loop through the array items. I'm going to use the shorthand for the functions using the arrow format and returning back a value that's going to be associated with the item in the array. And here we'll console log out the value of val. So loop through it again, and we see that this time, once again, we're outputting all of the values of the items in the array. I'm going to actually update these to some string values so that we have different values that are contained within there. And we're simply outputting all of the values that are contained within the array. Within the for each method, you can also get the index value of the item of the array. 
And you can also select the entire array value as we loop through. So that's going to return back that entire array within the console. You can also use a for in in order to loop through the items of the array. So that's using the for and we can select a variable just as we did within the each and specify the array that we're getting the value from. And we can now console log out the value results of val. I'm going to clear, I'm going to do a console clear, which will clear the contents of the console. So we've got the console was cleared and here we're looping through the value of the index items of the array. If we have an object, and I'm assigning some quick property names here, we can also loop through the object in the same way. We're returning back a value of val, and this time let's uh, loop through the object contents and refresh. So that's looping through the property names of the object that we have here. And just as we saw with the array, what it was doing is it's taking the index values of the array. So that's how we can assign and select the array contents. So just as we do with the property names, we can use a bracket notation and then use the index value that's being returned back in order to output the actual values that are contained within the array. And we can do the same thing for the object because these are going to be the property names of the object. And as we're looping through, this time we can return back the values that are being associated with that object. We can also use a JavaScript for of loop. And this is a statement that allows us to loop through values of an ir iterable object, such as an array. So once again, we'll select the value. And this time the keyword is of instead of in. So that's the only difference. And then the object that we can iterate through, and that's going to be the array. And we'll console log out what we have for value and refresh. And now we're able to return back the values without having to reference the array and using of instead of in is not going to, the in is going to be returning back the index values, whereas of is going to be returning back the actual values of the items in the array. There's also a while loop and a do while loop. So similar to the for loop, we need to set a parameter so we can loop while the value of i is less than 10. And we need to set a default starting value of i. So let's set that to zero. So just as we did in the for loop, we're setting a value of i, we're creating a condition for the loop to continue through while it's true, and we need a way to increment the value of i within the loop. So do the i incrementing by one, and then within the block of code, we're also going to output the value of i into the console. Once again, before we run this, I'll do a console clear to clear out the contents of the console. And just as we saw with the for loop, the while loop also lets us run through all of the content until that condition is no longer true. And that's when the loop is going to stop. You can also do a do while loop. And the difference between the do while loop and the while loop is that the do while loop will execute at least one time. So in this case, if the value of i is 100 and we loop through, we're not going to ever meet this condition as true. So while will never run because this condition is not true. Whereas if we do a do while loop, it will run it at least one time and the while condition will iterate the loop while that condition is true. So let's refresh it and we see that the do runs it at least one time while this condition is true. So those are a number of different ways that you can loop through items and content on your page. Let's set the value of i to 1, and then we'll update the value of i to be 100. And we'll see what the result is in the console. So first time we're coming in, the value of i is 1. So we log out the value of i. We increment the value of i till we reach 10. And at the point when it's 10, this loop is no longer going to run. We set the value of i to be 100 within the do we output it one time, we increment it by one, and if we were to check the value of i, the current value of i is 101, so this condition is no longer true. That means that the do is not going to run again because that condition is not true, and the value of i is 101. Let's do a clear of the console, and we'll select some page elements, and then we're going to update the content of those page elements dynamically using the loop. So we saw from before, 
where we can select them using a node list. So using the query selector all, we're going to select all the elements with the class of output. And for now, we'll log output into the console. And then we'll loop through the result. So we get a node list. It has a length of three. And we want to loop through each one of these and update the text content of those values. So let's select outputs. And we can use any number of the different loops. I usually prefer to use for each. And this selects out the element in the loop. Console log out the elements separately within the block of code of the loop. So that selects out each individual element with a class of output. So now let's select the text content from each one of those. And that will output all of the text content from all of the elements with a class of output. And just as we saw from before, where we can select the property, we can also reassign a new value to that property. And I'm just going to use the index value from the loop and assign a new value to that property. So this will just say new, and then we'll use whatever the value of index is, and we're going to add one to that value. So let's see what happens now. We refresh it, and now we get new one, two, and three. We can also take those and add event listeners. So add an on click, and every time it gets clicked, we can run this function, and this function will select that element, update the text content of that element as it gets clicked. I'm going to set a separate value within the element because it is an object, and I'll set the counter of this to be zero. Every time it gets clicked, the element value will increment by one, and we'll update the text content output to be whatever the value of the element value is going to be. So refresh. And now as I click them, they're going to each individually have their own event listeners that are updating the value of the element that's being clicked. And we can even update this to click. So let's set those. And it's tracking the click events on the elements separately, clicking them and tracking them within the element. So what's happening here is that element val, because this is an object and the element is an object just like any other object, we can assign variables into it. So I created a variable called element val, and I'm using that in order to track the number of clicks on that element. So go ahead and try it out. Create your own clicker on your page elements. Also try out the different ways to loop through array content and object content using the loops that have been covered in this lesson. And you can be ready to move on to the next part of the course. JavaScript comes with a lot of really cool built-in methods that you can make use of in order to update the values that you've got within your code. So we're going to be looking at various commonly used string methods and how we can manipulate the values of the strings. In addition, using random and how we can randomly generate a value. And then attaching all of these, chaining them together and attaching them to our interactive web page content. When it gets clicked, it's just generating brand new numbers and updating the text content of the elements with those numbers. So that's all coming up in this lesson. Open up your HTML file, link to a new JS file. I'm calling mine app7.js, so the blank JS file. And I'll show you some of the really cool things that you can do with some of the built-in methods that are already included within JavaScript. So for instance, we can generate random numbers so let's set up a way to generate some random numbers and output them into the page. So setting up a main container, I'm just going to declare a value of val and then use that and output that into the console. And now let's create a random value. So assign that value to val and we're going to use the math random. So this is built into JavaScript. And what it does is it creates a random value every time you run it that's going to be outputting this random value onto the page. So we're going to create a function that's going to generate a random number from one to whatever our total value is. So let's uh, do this. And as a total, let's start with 100. So we want to generate a random number from one to 100 and return that back in val. We're going to create a function and this will have the minimum and the maximum number that we want to generate. And within here, we're going to generate a value of val using math random. 
And what we want to do is we want to multiply the math random by a certain number. So if we want to multiply it by a value of whatever the max is, that's going to return back this random number multiplied by the max. So if our max is 100, it will automatically multiply this by 100. In order to get the proper number between the minimum and the maximum, we need to subtract the minimum off of the max and add the minimum back into that calculation. In order to get rid of the decimal places, we can use another math function, which is math floor. And what math floor does is it brings the value down to the lowest whole number. So in this case, if we are having a random value using math random, and we're going to multiply this value by 100, we're just going to end up with this type of result. So we try that again, and we get these random numbers, but we've got the decimal places. So if we wrap that within the math floor and have the math random number still multiplying by 100, that's going to return back a whole number for us. And that's why we're using math floor to get rid of the decimal places. So within this function, we want to return back the result of val. And in order to shorten this, we don't need to assign a variable to it where we can just return back whatever the value here is that's been calculated. So for the result of val, we're going to pass in whatever the minimum number is. So let's do 1. And the maximum value is going to be coming from the variable total. And we'll return that back into the console. So now every time we refresh, we get a new number. Let's add some event listeners to the elements. So I'm going to select all of the output elements. And using the query selector all, select all the elements with a class of output. And then we'll loop through those using for each and select each one of the elements that we can then add an event listener to that element. And I'm going to use the on click event. And whenever it gets clicked, it's going to run this anonymous function that's going to take the element and update the text content of the element with this random value. So refresh. So now every time I click it, it's updating with uh, these random values that are coming back from ran. So I also want to look at some string methods. And what string methods do is they allow us a way to work with string content. So let's uh, set up a string value for A. And this will say, hello world. And for the string, we do have a length value, which tells us how many characters are within the string. We can manipulate the string with JavaScript code. And I'm going to comment out the val, the value of val using the string value. And if we want to take out a part of the string, we can use slice. So we have to specify the string that we want to slice. And in this case, it's contained within A. So it's the same thing as typing in the string like this and then using the dot in order to connect a method to it and slice. So if we want to start and take out characters from this string starting at position 1 and ending at position 6, let's see what the result for a val is. So that returns back E-L-L-O space. And just as with arrays, it starts at uh, 0. And if we want to get the five characters in, we can end at index value of five. So it's going to return back that particular part of the variable and just replace it with A. So it's a little bit easier to read. So this is the string and we're doing a slice to the string. Extract out part of the string using substring. And there's various methods. They're very similar and you could use whichever one is most appropriate. So we'll take the value of A, which actually hasn't changed because we're just assigning that returned value to val. So it's not actually manipulating the string, the original string. And we'll use the substring, which is going to be different than the other substring. So the substring is going to be using a starting and finishing. So let's take the value of 7 and return back 
to character number 12. So starting at 7, and let's uh, actually start it at 6, and return back the word world off. And this is another commonly used string method. And this is substring. And this uses a starting value, but it's going to be returning back a length value. So instead of having to set the index value, we can say how many characters we want to return back. And that's where we're starting at position number six and returning back five characters after position number six. Substring is different from slice because it accepts negative indexes. And the difference between substring and slice is that substring returns back a character value. And if we just want to return back from negative index position five, that's going to actually return back the end of the string. So the negative value will automatically start from negative and count back five characters from the end. We can also replace string content using the replace method. So we need to specify the value that we want to replace, which is going to be world. And we're going to replace that with the word coders. So let's refresh. And now the value of A is still going to be hello world, but the value of val is the returned value from when we replaced world with coders. We're also able to convert string from upper to lowercase. So we can convert it all into uppercase using the string uppercase method. So that's going to just return back and update A, returning back to lowercase. If we have extra spacing around A, we can do a trim of the code. So val is equal to A and running the trim method. We'll trim any excess spacing from around it. And you can also update it in place as well. So adding in the trim, we can assign the value of A to A trimmed, and that will trim out the excess spacing that was around the string value. We can also select from the string using a search, which will return back the index value of the matching result. So that's at hello. If we're looking at LLO, the index value is two. We can also return back using index of, and then whatever we're searching for. So if we're searching for the two L's, that will return back the index of the two L's. If we're looking for a value that doesn't exist, so if we're looking for XL, it's gonna return back a value of negative one if it's not found within the search of the index. So these are some of the useful methods that you can use. And as we loop through the element and text content, let's update the text content to be whatever the element text content is, and we're gonna transform it to uppercase. So when we refresh the page, now all of them have the string methods attached and they're being applied as uppercase values. If we wanna remove out the word output, where we're gonna set it up as the string of the text content, and then we'll set the my string to equal whatever the my string value is, doing a replace of the word output. And we're gonna replace it with the string new words and then assign to the text content the value of my string and with string methods you can actually chain multiple string methods together so it will first remove out and replace output with new words and then transform it to uppercase and it is case sensitive so the output was actually uppercase so that's why it didn't pick it up on the first time that we ran the code so go ahead and try it out Try out some of the string methods, manipulating the string values, and also random, updating your web page code whenever it gets clicked.